just the kind of problem you'd have thought a computer would be good at solving. And it is, except for one thing. Somebody first has to tell it how to go about finding the solution. What we're really waiting for is the kind of computer to which you can give a problem and then leave it to work out the answer all by itself. The sort they write about in science fiction stories. The thinking machine. having you. There's a good dog. Here, yeah, master. Right. Well, that took a hell of a long time. What have you been doing, Spot, anyway? I've just memorized the maze. What on earth do you do that for? So we can find the way out, master. But we already know the way out. It's over there. Hmm. Well, you look at me that curious way for. Don't you agree? Affirmative. Right. Which way do you think it is, then? Bearing 132.3 degrees. Rubbish. I am now vectoring onto the correct course. That'll keep him occupied for a while. The great fun about a maze is to walk about it until you're thoroughly lost and you get that little bit of a feeling you may never, ever find your way out again. And, of course, you will find the exit you by luck, by instinct, by cheating or by some sort of system. A super-intelligent fictional robot like K-9 could probably find the exit without even having to memorise the maze but you could use a more conventional computer to solve the problem. First, it would have to be given a map of the maze, and because it couldn't apply intelligence, it would have to use a purely mechanical method, exploring all the paths before coming out with the shortest route to the exit. About time. Where have you been all this time? I told you it was that way. Negative, Master. Well, you said it was that way. Negative, Master. Right, well, tell me how to get out of here. Left. Forward 30 paces, right, left at the first turning, right at the next turning, seven paces forward, sharp left, sharp right, right All again, right, I left at the first... Come on, just show us. Let's see it. Now, which way are you going to go? This way. You know, for a so-called intelligent animal, your three-point turns are terrible. Compliments are unnecessary. Please follow. <laughs> Well, you don't need a computer as sophisticated as K9 to solve a maze. Even a small computer can do it, as long as it has a way of building up a mental map of the walls. In fact, it seems that the ability to learn in that way is something quite easy to get a computer to do. Let me show you another example. This microcomputer has been programmed to play a game, but in a rather unusual way. The game, of course, noughts and crosses, but at the moment, the computer doesn't know that. In fact, it doesn't know anything at all about the game. It doesn't know any of the rules, such as they are, nor what it's supposed to do to win. But it is programmed to try to win, if only it knew what that involved. Let me show you what I mean. I'm going to be X, and I shall put my first X in square number 5. And see what the computer does. It chooses to go there. OK. I shall go there. Not bad. I shall then go up there. And it's let me win. There wasn't very hard to beat. 
Now, in the course of playing a large number of games, it's going to learn. And eventually, it should be able to win, or at least force a draw every time. Now, Mac, how is it going to set about that learning process? Well, with noughts and crosses, it's not very difficult, actually. And all we have to do is... It's got one great thing that you haven't got. You've got a beautiful memory, I'm sure, but <laughs> that is the capability of never forgetting anything once it's been told. Yeah. So every game that it plays, it remembers exactly your moves and its moves, so that if it comes across the similar situation again, it can look back and find out whether from that position it won or it lost and take the appropriate action. If it can see a winning stream, it follows that. If it sees it's going to lose there, it does something else. Well, in fact, this programme has one other useful feature. You can arrange for it to get all its experience by playing against itself without any human intervention. So you're not condemned to playing 10,000 games of noughts and crosses against a rather taciturn opponent. I'll just start it off. Now we can leave it to its own devices. Well, getting computers to learn may be one step on the road to making them at least seem intelligent. But there is an enormous gap between a machine which is good at solving mazes or can play noughts and crosses and one which has any of the qualities we normally associate with the word intelligence. But many computer scientists want no less than to create machines which think like people do. We asked a number of experts what the purpose of their work was, and this is what Professor Roger Shank of the University of Yale told us. It's certainly the case that we intend to mimic human beings. Uh, the, the, basically, the goal of our research is to build computers that are just like people. Um, the, the idea that computers would somehow be better than people is something to aim at, but we really have a whole lot of problem just equaling them first. We have gotten a tremendous respect for human capabilities through this work and uh, the idea of surpassing them is a little a little in the future only a little in the future mac no i hardly think so i believe that if he has raised money to build computers like human beings he's got job security for a long long time in the future but there are certain things of course that we take for granted and to us it's extremely simple which computers find extremely difficult and for example Knowing where it is, you can stick a television camera on front of a robot, it can see what is happening on a television screen, but it has no idea what that is, and it's extremely difficult for it to understand what it is a picture of. Well, I think I can show you. Right, Chris, tell me what you can see. Um, well, McNaught Davis sitting on a chair. Well, that's not what you can actually see. What you're actually seeing is this curious shape up a part here, which will be flat, and you've got white legs going down the side and these legs going down the front. Oh, I see what you mean, but I mean, I, I know... I recognise a person when I see one, and I recognise a chair when I see one. And if a person is in a sitting posture on a chair that I recognise as a chair, that's good enough for me. I recognise the person sitting down. Well, it's simple to you, but it is very difficult for a computer. You'd recognise it as a chair, even if it was a deck chair, an armchair, a high back chair, a simple wooden chair, and you'd recognise the human shape, whatever race, whatever size, whatever sex it was. You'd even see this, which is a completely different shape to me. You'd recognise as a human, and with one leg showing, you'd recognise that as someone sitting on a chair. You might even recognise it as Whistler's mother, but a computer would have to store an immense amount of information to come out with that sort of an answer. And I suppose it must be just as difficult for computers to speak and understand human languages for the same sort of reasons. Now, here's the first sentence of a story. George was having lunch with another teacher and grading homework, or correcting homework, when the waitress accidentally knocked a glass of Coke on him. Now, it seems quite straightforward, doesn't it? You know from just that one sentence what George does for a living and where the scene took place. But for a computer, it's not so simple. It would have to know a great deal about human behavior to work it out. One of Roger Shank's postgraduates, Mike Dyer, explains. Now, there are a number of issues here. Um, first, we have several different types of knowledge. We have lunch. Uh, we have uh, occupations such as teacher. We have, uh, we have the, the waitress. Um, notice, for example, that anyone who reads this story uh, realizes that we're in a restaurant, but nowhere in the text does it specifically say that we are in a restaurant. There's a mention of a waitress, but we wouldn't want the program to assume that when you mention the word waitress that you're in a restaurant, as in the case of John is in love with a waitress. However, in this case, how is it that the program knows that we're in a restaurant? It's the combination of knowing that lunch is something that uh, 
restaurants serve, combined with the existence of the waitress um, who's serving it, and so on, that, that indicates that, uh, to the program that um, we're in a restaurant. And this is what some of the computer's accumulated knowledge looks like when displayed on the screen. It may look complicated, but it's nothing to the kind of understanding we carry around in our heads all the time. And here's another example. It doesn't say here what George does for a living, but how is the computer to work it out? Most people make that inference at the point that they see that George was having lunch with another teacher. Um, now, however, that inference alone, you can't just have a simple rule that says if you see uh, X is with another X, then X is that thing also, because you could have, uh, uh, I saw Sarah with another man. Does that mean that Sarah is also a man? But if you say, I saw George with another teacher, it makes sense to say that George is also a teacher. So it's very complicated. Uh, you have to look at the relationships that are going on. You can't just have a simple rule. The end result is that we can ask the computer questions about the story and receive answers which show that the machine has in some way understood what's been fed into it. Where did George have lunch? At the restaurant. What did George do for a living? Answer, George was a teacher. How did the waitress feel at the restaurant? Answer, the waitress regretted that she spilled coke on George, and so on. It was really quite impressive for a machine. But it is a very small world that the computer knows about. Uh, the programs that we have are um, capable of understanding within limited domains. That is, if you program them to, to talk about football, they can talk about football. If you program them to talk about, um, talk about movies, they can talk about movies, perhaps. But if you want them to talk about everything, if you want them to have opinions on life, if you want a full range of subjects, a, we're far away from that. We're far away from the, the philosophical computer, the uh, all-knowing, uh, omniscient uh, computer. Ah. Hmm. Well, a general conversation, let alone wisdom and understanding of life, is still a little beyond today's generation of computers. But if I wanted to do something less philosophical, like start this blooming car, I could use a different approach, the so-called expert system. Now, Mac, what, what does that mean, expert system? Well, you can think of it almost like a book like this, which will tell you how to start your car with a set of rules, if you like, which are written by an expert. And right. we can turn to a page and it might just help us. Right, look at the fuel gauge. Have you got any, got any <laughs> petrol in your car? Yes, I put something in just before getting here, yes. Right, well, it says here, if it fails to start, try it again with your foot on the floor and try and see if it starts. Foot on the floor? Right. All right. Foot on the floor. Start. That's enough. Whoop. Nothing. Number two, look for leaks. These can occur anywhere in the petrol line between the tank and the engine. Any leaks? Can't smell any petrol. No. Nothing. Three, check fuel pump. This is beginning to sound like uh, a computer, actually. <laughs> I mean, is it the sort of thing you can use on a computer? Well, it is. Essentially, it's a, it's a set of rules, and you can go through it saying if there's a spark, if there's petrol in the tank, if the engine turns, then there's a high probability it's something wrong with your carburetor. Right. And this is where a computer system would differ from this book because it can deal in probabilities. That's what we mean by a computerized expert system. An expert that's put all these rules that we're talking about into a computer itself. And we've got one of these programs here. And we, there are three things that could have gone wrong with your car. There's something wrong with the electrics, there's something wrong with the sp spark, and there's something wrong with your fuel line. Now, well, we know it wasn't the electrics because the starter was turning the engine over quite well. So it's a choice between the ignition and the fuel. And um, let's opt for the fuel, shall we? Right, so let's they try. Can diagnose. Okay. Right, question one. How certainly are there's petrol in the tank? I'll just put some in there, no problem. So no problem. Now, what we can do is enter this uncertainty in there from a scale on minus five through zero to plus five. Right. And zero means I've no idea. Minus five is it's definitely not, and plus five it definitely is. Right. So you've got that range of certainty. So we put in five, which effectively says we're certain there's fuel in the tank. Yeah. How certain are you that petrol is reaching the carburetor? Um... Well, I got here, so there must be some getting through somewhere, but then it has broken down, so it's, I, it's difficult to say. I don't know. I'm reasonably certain, I would Reasonably say. certain. Let's give that a four. And it's not absolutely certain. You'd have to take the pie bottom and be absolutely certain. Yeah. Right. Remove each of the spark plugs one at a time. How certain are you that the spark plugs are wet with petrol? 
<laughs> I, I don't really feel like doing that. And anyway, I could be broken down beside the road or something. So can I say I don't know? Can we'll you just say that. don't know? Right. We've done it now. We've got here. There's a fault in the fuel system with a certainty which is high. And that's at three between that range between north yes. and five. It's a fairly high certainty there's a fault in the fuel system. The float needle in your carburetor is sticking with a certainty of 4.13. And out of five, that's a very high certainty. That's your problem. And there's a block jet in the carburetor with a certainty of two, which means it's an average certainty. It's one of those two. Well, ten out of ten, because I happen to know what the fault is, because it happens all the time on this car. It's a, a sticking needle valve in the float chamber. I think the expert that put the programme into the computer already knew that too. I wonder if by the time we get to the stage of having the computer in the car, they will also have on the computer my own particular solution to the sticking needle valve. Ah, the skill is knowing where to hit, though. That's right. You've got to hit it just there. That'll be known to fail, then. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Ha-ha! Well done. Terrific. We have contact. Well, that computerized car mechanic was designed as a commercial demonstration to show what expert systems can do. There are larger and more powerful programs of this kind already in use in science and medicine and mineral exploration, for example. But their use is not restricted to large and expensive computer installations. At St. James's Hospital in Leeds, there's a project underway which shows that even a home microcomputer can play a role in medical diagnosis. And, as with any consultation, the first step is to find out the patient's medical history. Do you get the pain? Um, up here. Up at the right, at the top of your stomach. That's right, yes. I see. And how long have you had this pain for? Um, for about a week. Only for a week? Um, well, for about two years, on and off. I see. So it first came on? Two years ago? Yes. Before that, you didn't have any no. pain at no, all? No, I didn't. No. So over the last two years, you've been getting this pain, what, all the time, or does it come and go, or...? For about two or three times a week. comes on, does it? How long does it last when it comes on? About an hour. Has the doctor given you any medicines for this? No, he hasn't. Is there any history in your family of stomach problems, or...? Not, not to my knowledge. No. Interpreting yeah. answers isn't something a computer does very well, but the nature and order of the questions is determined by the way the information has to be entered into the computer. And what, what is your job? Or I'm a housewife. You're a housewife, are you? Right, then, well, I think that's all I want to ask you. Uh, you'll be going through now to see the doctor, and he'll be having a look at this and deciding what will be the best thing to do for you. Thank okay. you very much. The system is explained by the man who devised it, Mr. Tim de Domble. Well, if you want a computer to help you with diagnosis, you've got to do a number of things. Uh, the first, and perhaps the most, arguably the most difficult, is to collect information from the patient. And in the example which we've just seen, that's what was being done. Now, this can be done either by the doctor or by a nursing sister or a medical student, or as in this specially constructed example, by our research assistant who was talking to the patient and going in great detail into the patient's symptoms uh, so as to get them as nearly as possible uh, correct. The data is entered into the computer with each of the symptoms having its own code number. Patient symptoms are typed in one by one, and the computer confirms that they've been entered correctly. The computer then compares the case history in question with a large number of records of patients with similar complaints, and on the basis of this comparison, makes a diagnostic prediction, which is displayed on the screen. The computer's conclusions can be printed out for the doctor to study later. There are still some schools of thought which say that the computer should be made to try and think like a doctor. I'd have to say that this isn't the way that we think of it. Uh, we think of the doctor as being the focal point of the diagnostic process. 
because the doctor's the only person who can look at the whole aspect of the uh, process. He can look at the symptoms and the signs and the impressions he gets from the patient and the blood tests and the x-rays and put the whole picture together. Computers at the moment don't do that at all well. In fact, they do it rather badly. Nevertheless, just as the doctor turns to a blood test to help him look at the analysis of the patient's blood, he turns to the x-ray to look at the patient's bones, there seems to me to be no reason why he shouldn't, in addition, turn to the computer and look at that to help him analyze the patient's symptoms. But it's then at the end of the day, it's the doctor who puts the information together and he makes the final decision about the patient. In this project, the computer is being used almost entirely to handle and compare information. But does this qualify as artificial intelligence? Uh, speaking purely personally, I don't think it does. And when we discuss this problem, sometimes uh, I like to use the analogy of fictional computers to make the point. I, I think, for example, that we're not looking at something like uh, Big Brother in uh, 1984. And even less do I think we're looking at something like HAL in 2001, which is, uh, you may recall, took over and ran the place and eventually to the detriment of the human beings. I think if we're looking at anything, we're looking at something like R2-D2 in uh, Star Wars, whose function was simply to carry information to the right point uh, at the right time and enable the people concerned to make a winning decision. Well, the information in Tim de Dombal's system comes from real medical cases, but the Noughts and Crosses program on our microbe has been learning all by itself. Now, let's see if its standard has improved over the last half hour. You'll move one to nine. Well, you can play if you like, Matthew. Oh, I'm delightful. Five. The one thing you can't do on these is cheat. Because it knows all about it. You can see it's taking longer. Yes, that's wrong. Thinking, wrong Thinking word. All Thinking all the time. Yeah. <laughs> ah. It's won. It's beaten you. It did. Yes. Yes. So it has learned something, and it's it even knows long. when it's won. Well, in a short program like this, we've only been able to skate over the surface of some of the most interesting and important developments in computer science today. But if the amount of effort and money being poured into this kind of research is any to go by, we can expect some surprises in the not-too-distant future. <laughs>